Mark, this is Democracy Now! This is dis- disgusting, intolerable, it's not Texan, and uh, we are going to aggressively prosecute it both as capital murder but also as a hate crime, which is exactly what it appears to be. It was a deadly weekend in America. Over the span of 13 hours, the country was shaken by two mass shootings. An anti-immigrant white supremacist gunman shot dead 20 people, overwhelmingly Latino, in a crowded Walmart in El Paso, Texas. 13 hours later, a gunman who had a history of threatening women shot dead nine people, including his own sister outside a bar in Dayton, Ohio. Most of the victims were African-American. President Trump briefly spoke of the killing Sunday, but did not mention guns, domestic terror, or white nationalism. On the campaign trail, many Democrats say the president is partly to blame for what happened in El Paso. The president's language, his rhetoric, has produced the kinds of hate crimes that we saw in El Paso yesterday, but we've been seeing across this country, they've been on the rise for each one of the last three years. We'll go to El Paso for response to Saturday's tragedy, and we'll speak to a former FBI agent about how the government has failed to confront growing white nationalist violence. And we'll look at how this weekend's mass shootings will impact the debate over guns in America as the NRA implodes. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. At least 29 people were killed as two mass murders shook the country over the weekend. In El Paso, Texas, a white supremacist gunman opened fire at a Walmart near a mall Saturday. The mass murderer is believed to be Patrick Crucius, a 21-year-old white man now in police custody. The gunman posted a racist anti-immigrant manifesto online in which he said he was, quote, defending my country from cultural and ethnic replacement brought on by an invasion, unquote, echoing the language used by President Trump to describe migrants. The El Paso attack came just days after another white male shooter attacked the Gilroy Garlic Festival in California, killing three people, including a six-year-old boy. Just before that shooting, the gunman promoted an anti-immigrant manifesto online. It also came days after a Walmart worker in Mississippi shot and killed two fellow employees and wounded two others. Nationwide calls are growing for Walmart to stop selling guns and ammunition. The El Paso massacre is being treated as an act of domestic terrorism. This is U.S. Attorney John Bash. The key factor here is it appears to be an intent to coerce or intimidate a civilian population. Uh, that's met here. It, the attack, from what we know in the public record, certainly appears to be intimidate, intended to intimidate or coerce a civilian population. So we're treating it as a domestic terrorism case. El Paso's district attorney said he's charging the shooter with capital murder, which carries a possible death penalty. He could also face federal hate crime charges, which also can result in a capital punishment sentence. Frederick Brennan, the founder of the website 8chan, has called for his site to be shut down following the massacre in El Paso. The shooter posted about the attack shortly before it happened on an 8chan message board. At least three recent mass shootings have been announced on on the site, including the massacre at two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand, that killed 50 Muslims in March. 8chan's network provider Cloudflare dropped the site following the shooting. Mexican Foreign Minister Marcelo Ebrard called the attack a terrorist act against innocent Mexicans. Mexican President Andrés Manuel López Obrador, who said seven Mexican nationals were among the 20 killed, said Mexico is considering measures to protect Mexicans who are in the U.S. He also said Mexico may charge the shooter in Mexican courts. U.S. Democratic lawmakers are calling for the Senate to return from recess to vote on two gun safety bills recently passed in the House. Hours after El Paso's horrific attack, in the early hours of Sunday morning, a gunman opened fire with a high-caliber rifle outside a bar in a popular downtown entertainment district in Dayton, Ohio, 
killing nine people and wounding dozens of others, all in under a minute. Police killed the suspect at the scene. He was identified as 24-year-old white male Connor Betts. He has a history of threatening women and former classmates, saying he had a kill list and a rape list in high school. The victims were mostly in their 20s and 30s. Most of them were African American. One of the victims, Megan Betts, was the gunman's sister. At a vigil Sunday, crowds interrupted a speech by Ohio's Republican Governor Mike DeWine with shouts of, make a change and do something. And, of course, as governor, I'm here representing uh, all the people of the state of Ohio. Do something! You're here tonight. Also on Sunday, the captain of the Philadelphia Union soccer team, soccer star Alejandro Bedoya, grabbed a field microphone after he scored a goal and demanded Congress take action following the two shootings. Congress, do something now! End gun violence! Let's go! That was Alejandro Bedoya. He said, Congress, do something now. End gun violence. He lives just 15 minutes from the Parkland massacre in Florida. In Hong Kong, a general strike has paralyzed the city's transportation and shut down many businesses and large parts of the service industry as pro-democracy protesters escalate their demands. Hundreds of flights have also been canceled. Demonstrators took to the streets over the weekend, blocking major roads, with riot police firing tear gas at crowds and arresting at least 80 people. The popular uprising started nine weeks ago to demand the withdrawal of an extra extradition bill that would have sent people from Hong Kong to mainland China to face charges, but demands quickly grew for the resignation of Hong Kong's leader, Carrie Lam, an investigation into violence against demonstrators and pro-independence reforms. Carrie Lam warned Hong Kong is being pushed to the verge of a very dangerous situation. India announced it's revoking Kashmir's special status as tensions with Pakistan over the disputed region have been rising over recent days. The move, which is expected to be challenged in court, means Hindu Indians from outside Kashmir could start buying land and settling in the region, among other actions that will shift the demographic makeup of the Indian-administered Muslim-majority state. Critics and many Kashmiris say this would threaten the state's autonomy, further consolidating it into Indian rule. India's governing BJ party promised during election campaigning this year it would rescind Kashmir's special status. India's home minister also said it would split the state into two federally ruled territories. India sent 10,000 additional troops to the region over the past week and shut down schools, evacuated tourists, and cut off Internet access. Kashmir leaders have also been placed under house arrest. In February, tensions between India and Pakistan ratcheted up over the region. Region. India carried out airstrikes inside Pakistan following an attack against Indian soldiers in Kashmir by a militant separatist group based in Pakistan. Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan, who recently met with Trump at the White House, tweeted, President Trump offered to mediate on Kashmir. This is the time to do so. A situation deteriorates there. This has the potential to blow up into a regional crisis, the Prime Minister said. Iran said Sunday it seized another foreign oil tanker. The Revolutionary Guard said the vessel was from Iraq and carrying smuggled diesel fuel through the Persian Gulf. Iraq has denied the accusation, saying it, quote, does not export diesel to the international market, unquote. This is the third vessel seized by Iran in recent weeks, including the British Stena Empiro, which is still being held after it was captured in the Strait of Hormuz last month. That followed Britain's seizure of an Iranian tanker off the coast of Gibraltar which Britain accused of breaching international sanctions. In more news from Iran, government officials confirm reports that Iran turned down an invitation for Foreign Minister Mohammad Javad Zarif to visit the White House for talks last month. The invitation preceded the imposition of U.S. sanctions on Zarif, whom the Trump administration branded a propaganda minister. Iran has accused the United States of shutting down any possibility for talks between the two countries by sanctioning its top diplomat. 
In Russia, at least 800 people were arrested Saturday as protesters took to the streets of Moscow again to call out the barring of opposition candidates in upcoming Moscow City Council elections. Videos of police beating protesters with batons spread on social media over the weekend. Police also reportedly made arrests before the protests even started. Meanwhile, opposition leader Alexei Navalny, who was arrested last month ahead of mass protests, is being investigated for money laundering. Navalny's anti-corruption group has worked to expose top Russian officials. He was hospitalized last weekend when his doctor said Navalny appeared to have symptoms of poisoning. But Navalny has since been returned to jail. Sudan's Transitional Military Council and leaders from the protest movement signed a constitutional declaration Sunday that they say will usher in a transition to civilian rule. Months of unrest and deadly protests have followed the April overthrow of Sudan's former authoritarian President Omar al-Bashir after a mass popular uprising. The two sides agreed to a power-sharing deal last month, but talks have been repeatedly derailed due to violent incidents, including most recently a deadly attack by security forces on teenage students protesting military rule. In Mexico, journalists and press freedom advocates are calling for the government of Andrés Manuel López Obrador to take meaningful action after three more journalists were killed, all within a week. Jorge Ruiz Vázquez was fatally shot in his home in the state of Veracruz on Friday, just days before he was to testify about death threats he said originated from his mayor of his town. He accused the mayor of corruption last year. In the state of Guerrero, Edgar Alberto Nava, the published who published local stories on a Facebook page, was also shot dead Friday. Nava reported on local government as well as crime. And journalist Rogelio Baragan was found dead in the trunk of a car earlier last week in the state of Morelos. Both Baragan and Nava cited safety concerns due to their work. The three recent murders bring the total number of journalists killed in Mexico this year to 10. Reporters Without Borders calls Mexico one of the world's deadliest countries for the media. In Puerto Rico. Pedro Pierluisi was sworn in as the new governor after his disgraced predecessor, Ricardo Rosselló, officially stepped down Friday following weeks of mass protests. However, the Puerto Rican Senate has not yet voted to approve Pierluisi as the new governor, leading many Puerto Ricans to question his legitimacy. What Pedro Pierluisi did was a coup d'etat. He understands he's not the governor himself. Notice that he said we would have to go to the Senate. Well, if he needs to go to the Senate, then whose job is it? The governorship? It's the Justice Secretary's, Wanda Vasquez's job. Someone who has to swear in, in the dark over there, and later say, I've already been sworn in, obviously knows he's not doing things properly. Pierre Luisi previously served as Puerto Rico's resident commissioner or non-voting representative in Congress from 2009 to 2017. He was one of the key advocates behind the creation of the Puerto Rico Oversight, Management and Economic Stability Act, known as PROMESA, which created an unelected, federally appointed control board with sweeping powers to run Puerto Rico's economy. San Juan Mayor Carmen Yulín Cruz is filing a lawsuit today over Pierre Luisi's appointment as governor. U.S. federal prosecutors have accused Honduran President Juan Orlando Hernandez of conspiring with his brother and other top political figures to protect drug traffickers in exchange for campaign contributions. Tony Hernandez, the president's brother, was arrested last year in the United States for drug trafficking and weapon offenses. Former President Porfirio Lobo, who came to power following a U.S.-backed coup in 2009, is also accused of participating in the scheme. Prosecutors say President Hernandez used $1.5 million in drug trafficking money to help him win the 2013 presidency. Juan Orlando Hernandez has denied the accusations. Mass protests have been taking place for months against the Hernandez government, which Hondurans say is ruled by corruption, as well as his plans to privatize health care, pensions and education. A 32-year-old man from El Salvador died Thursday in a New Mexico immigration jail. Marvin Antonio Gonzalez had traveled to the United States with his young daughter. His daughter is now being held by U.S. immigration authorities. The cause of death has yet to be determined. This is Antonio Gonzalez's father speaking in El Salvador. He said he wanted to go. 
he could no longer stand the poverty, that he could get a job in the United States so that he could rise up from poverty. That was his intention. That was his idea for going. At least 15 asylum seekers have died while in U.S. custody since September of last year. Seven of them were children. President Trump said Friday he will not nominate Texas Congressmember John Ratcliffe to replace Dan Coats as director of national intelligence. Trump blamed the, quote, lamestream media for treating Ratcliffe unfairly as reports emerged over the past week of bipartisan concerns over Ratcliffe's qualifications for the role, namely that he exaggerated his accomplishments as a former federal prosecutor in East Texas, claiming he had lots of experience jailing terrorists and helping form George W. Bush's counterterrorism policy. According to former co-workers, there were no major national security prosecutions during his tenure. Meanwhile, Trump is reportedly planning to block Deputy Director of National Intelligence Sue Gordon from becoming acting director when Dan Coates steps down later this month, possibly by ousting her from her current position. Critics say the move would fall within the administration's pattern of prioritizing political picks over career staffers. And in New York City, an administrative judge for the New York Police Department recommended Friday that Daniel Pantaleo, the officer who killed Eric Garner in 2014 by using an illegal chokehold, the judge recommended he be fired. Pantaleo held Garner, an unarmed African-American man, in the chokehold until he dropped to the ground, despite gasping, I can't breathe, 11 times. Pantaleo was suspended following the recommendation. But New York Police Department Commissioner James O'Neill will make the final decision on whether or not to fire him. Pantaleo has remained on the police force on desk duty since the murder. A New York grand jury decided in 2014 not to charge him, and last month the Justice Department said he would also not face federal charges. Eric Garner's daughter, Emerald Garner Snipes, spoke out after the judge's recommendation was made public. Public. This has been a long battle, five years too long. And finally, somebody has said that there's some information that this cop has done something wrong. We've waited five years. CCRB has made the recommendation. Commissioner O'Neill, fire Pantaleo. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. It was a deadly weekend in America. Over the span of 13 hours, the country was rocked by two mass shootings. At around a 10.30 Saturday morning, a heavily armed gunman opened fire inside a crowded Walmart in El Paso, Texas. Authorities say 20 people were shot dead. The victims were predominantly Latino, including seven Mexican nationals. At least two dozen people were injured. Then, just after 1 a.m. on Sunday, a gunman in Dayton, Ohio, shot dead nine people outside a bar in the city's historic Oregon district. The dead included the gunman's own sister. Most of the dead were African Americans. Police are still investigating the motive of the Dayton gunman, a white male named Connor Betts. According to news reports, the 24-year-old had been suspended from high school after compiling lists of girls he wanted to rape and kill. Meanwhile, federal authorities are treating the El Paso attack as an act of domestic terrorism. The suspected El Paso gunman has been identified as 21-year-old white male named Patrick Crucius, who lives 600 miles miles away in a suburb of Dallas. Shortly before the attack in El Paso, the gunman posted an anti-immigrant manifesto on the far-right message board 8chan, which had also been used by the gunman who attacked two mosques in New Zealand and killed 50 Muslims, and the gunman who attacked a San Diego synagogue. On Sunday, the founder of 8chan called for the site to be taken down. Some of the language in the manifesto echoed remarks by President Trump, including his use of the word invasion to describe immigrants crossing the southern border. On Sunday, President Trump briefly spoke about the shootings in El Paso and Dayton, but did not refer to guns, domestic terrorism or white nationalism or supremacy in his remarks. President Trump is scheduled to address the nation today at 10 a.m. On the presidential campaign trail, a number of Democratic candidates linked the shooting in El Paso to Trump's anti-immigrant rhetoric. 
Former Congressman Beto O'Rourke, who is from El Paso, accused Trump of stoking racism. South Bend Mayor Pete Buttigieg said Trump is not helping to stop what he described as a, quote, lethal, violent, white nationalist terrorism. Meanwhile, Senator Bernie Sanders called on Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell to hold a special session of the Senate to pass a gun safety bill. The El Paso attack came just days after a white male shooter attacked the Gilroy Garlic Festival in in Northern California, killing three people. The gunman in Gilroy promoted an anti-immigrant manifesto online just hours before the shooting. According to The New York Times, white extremist shooters have killed at least 63 people in the United States over the past 18 months. We go now to El Paso, where we're joined by two guests. Cesar Blanco is a Democratic member of the Texas House of Representatives. Fernando Garcia is the founding director of the Border Network for Human Rights and advocacy group based in El Paso. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! First of all, condolences on the horror that has taken place uh, in your community in El Paso. Um, we want to begin with Cesar Blanco. Um, if you could talk about what your t tell us about your community in El Paso, and then tell us what you're demanding right now. Well, uh, thank you, Amy. Uh, our El Paso is a warm, uh, welcoming, uh, binational uh, community located on the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, our sister city uh, to the south of us in Mexico is Juarez. Uh, we are a community that is very tight-knit. Uh, we are a community that opens its arms uh, to immigrants uh, and welcomes immigrants. Uh, this community is a community of immigrants. Uh, my father was an immigrant from uh, the state of Chihuahua in Mexico. Um, uh, this is tragic, uh, and uh, it's, it's horrible that we're seeing these type of acts of violence and murder uh, tied to white supremacy uh, occurring here in our, in our communities. Um, we need to see action. Uh, we need uh, the words of the president uh, have been harmful. Uh, and it's, it's unfortunate that this president has not condemned uh, this white national uh, violent acts here in our communities and other communities across the country. Uh, and uh, it's horrible that the United States Senate uh, has not taken any action in, in terms of gun reform uh, to not allow these type of weapons to reach the hands of these individuals who, wants to, who create havoc uh, and fear in our communities. Describe for us what you understand took place on Saturday morning at that Walmart. Well, early, uh, uh, about 10 to 10.30, uh, there were uh, calls, 911 calls to police. Uh, a gunman uh, began firing in the uh, parking lot uh, of Walmart uh, here in El Paso, and uh, he entered uh, the, the, the store. Um, began uh, shooting and firing uh, at uh, individuals. Uh, this community is uh, majority Latino. Uh, he drove in 600 miles uh, to perform these acts of violence against our community. We have seen in his manifesto uh, the level of hate uh, toward our community and toward immigrants uh, in this country, and uh, clearly it looks like it was uh, an intentional act. Um, throughout the day, uh, families have... Uh, had been waiting uh, to hear news. Uh, uh, they set up a family reunification center uh, in the elementary school that I attended uh, as a kid uh, to allow families to wait to hear either the good news or the bad news. Unfortunately, uh, for many, uh, the bad news was that their family uh, members were killed uh, by this uh, individual. Fernando Garcia, founding director of the Border Network for Human Rights, um, can you talk about the reports that some survivors were afraid to get help? Um, maybe they were injured, but afraid because of their status right now, their immigration status. Yes, Amy. Uh, listen, <clears throat> uh, throughout like, the last, actually, two days, we had received several calls from families um, that were afraid of actually going into the hospitals and clinics because they, they saw so many uh, Border Patrol personnel and vehicles, uh, and they were actually not reporting their injuries, and they were actually 
going to the hospitals and clinics on their own. So they call us, and what we did is we, we evidently we called our Congresswoman Escobar uh, because we wanted the uh, Border Patrol and ICE to actually issue a statement that they would not enforce uh, immigration laws uh, these days in El Paso. And I think people are still, are still afraid of that, because even before this, this shooting happened, people were afraid already of immigration enforcement. So I think uh, little by little, people is getting a little bit more comfortable, obviously, but uh, it's going to take a little bit more than that. Uh, at this point, we are still receiving calls of people being afraid of uh, reporting their injuries to the hospitals and the authorities because of uh, the fear that they have with immigration. Do you believe that Latinos were targeted? I mean, clearly in this so-called manifesto, I mean, right before the gunman opened fire at the Walmart in El Paso, he <clears throat> posted this anti-immigrant screed, apparently um, attributed to him, uh, it appeared online. The manifesto is titled, The Inconvenient Truth About Me. It reads in part, quote, I support the Christchurch shooter and his manifesto. This attack is a response to the Hispanic invasion of Texas. They are the instigators, not me. I am simply defending my country from cultural and ethnic replacement brought on by an invasion. Hispanics will take control of the local and state government of my beloved Texas, changing policy to better suit their needs. They will turn Texas into an instrument of a political coup which will hasten the destruction of our country the manifesto read. It also cites the Great Replacement Theory, the white nationalist right-wing conspiracy theory, which was also evoked during the white supremacist rally in Charlottesville in Virginia in 2017, when the neo-Nazis chanted, Jules will not replace us. The author of the El Paso Manifesto claims his views, quote, predate Trump and his campaign, but the manifesto borrows a number of Trump's popular slogans, including send them back and fake news, which Trump also repeated fake news. Trump did not refer to the Latinos who were killed, who were targeted. He said today's he tweeted very little and spoke little this weekend about El Paso and Dayton, but did tweet today's shooting in El Paso, Texas, was not only tragic, it was an act of cowardice. I know that I stand with everyone in this country to condemn today's hateful act. There are no reasons or excuses that will ever justify killing innocent people. Do you, like Beto O'Rourke and uh, Senator Sanders and others, believe that Trump is partially responsible for what took place? Let me put that to question. Amy, listen, Go ahead. El Paso. Yes, yes. Uh, let, let me tell you that what we saw was an attack against a symbol. El Paso has become a symbol of resistance to all of what Trump represents. Every strategy that he implemented at the border started in El Paso. And our community reacted, and our community resisted. The separation of children, uh, returning refugees to Mexico, children dying in our uh, in border patrol stations and ICE stations. So our our community uh, has shown uh, resilience to this aggressive anti-immigrant agenda of this president. But also our community has welcomed refugees. We had opened our homes, our city, to refugees and immigrants, and uh, in 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 the sense that we were punished because of that. We need to call it what it is. You know, f a few months ago, we had the white supremacist militias coming down to El Paso region. At, a, at that time, we talked to them and we engaged with them. And they were and what they were saying at that time is that they were responding to Trump's call to action to come to the border to protect the border from the invasion of criminals. Obviously, they were referring to in, uh, children and refugees and mothers. So we need to call this what it is. This was the result of Trump's racist agenda, Trump's hate towards Mexicans and immigrants. I mean, we, we cannot call it any other way. And, and, and I believe that Trump is very cynical today that, uh, that this, this, he's calling this shooting uh, uh, or his labeling uh, has uh, the shooting has a mental health issue. It is not true. Once again, he needs to accept responsibility for what, what he has done. Words matter. And today, Trump's words killed El Pasoans. Earlier this year, President Trump traveled to Panama City Beach in Florida's panhandle for a campaign rally. 
where he laughed in approval when an audience member shouted that migrants crossing into the United States should be shot. The interaction came as Trump was praising border security workers. We don't let them, and we can't let them use weapons. We can't. Other countries do. We can't. I would never do that. But how do you stop these people? You can't. There's no... That's only in the panhandle you can get away with that statement. So the audience member shouted, shoot them, and he said, only in the panhandle, he said. Um, can you repeat that? Um, I'd like to turn to Democratic presidential candidate, uh, New Jersey Senator Cory Booker. In an interview on CNN's State of the Union Sunday, he said President Trump's responsible for the mass shootings. I turn my attention to the person who is uh, leading this country, who is, in my opinion, in this moral moment, who is failing. And I think that at the end of the day, especially because this was a white supremacist manifesto, uh, that I want to say with more moral clarity that Donald Trump is responsible for this. He's responsible because he is stoking uh, fears and hatred and bigotry. He is responsible because he's failing to condemn white supremacy and see it as it is, which is responsible for such a significant amount of the terrorist attacks. He's responsible because he is president of the United States and has failed to do anything significant to stop the mass availability of weapons to people who intend to do harm. So that was Cory Booker. Um, I also want to turn to um, Fox and Friends uh, to turn to Texas Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, um, who said it's the video game industry that was responsible for the rise in mass shootings. How long are we going to let, for example, and, and ignore at the federal level particularly, where they can do something about the video game industry? You know, in this manifesto that we believe is from the shooter, this manifesto, he talks about living out his super soldier fantasy on Call of Duty. We know that uh, the video game industry is bigger than the movie industry and the music industry combined. And there have been studies that say it impacts people and studies that says it does not. But I look at the common denominators as, as a 60-some-year-old father and grandfather myself. What's changed in this country? We've always had guns. We've always had evil. But what's changed where we see this rash of shooting? And I, and I see a, a video game industry that, that teaches young people to kill Video games. House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy made a similar claim later on Sunday in an interview on Fox. But the idea of these video games to dehumanize individuals, to um, have a game of shooting individuals and others, I've always felt that is a problem for um, future generations and others. Uh, we, we've watched from studies shown before of what it does to individuals. Um, when you look at these photos of how it took place, um, you, you can see the actions within video games and Do others. So you have Republican leaders, you have President Trump refusing to talk about both guns and white supremacy. Um, I want to put this question to um, El Paso Representative uh, Cesar Blanco. The issue of guns. Texas, your state is an open carry state. Explain what that means. And now um, a number of Democrats are demanding that uh, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell call a special session of the Senate so they can pass gun control legislation. Even the extremely conservative New York Post in New York is calling for a weapons ban. Um, can you respond to the state of your state in Texas, uh, Walmart, where this took place, and the Mississippi Walmart a few days before where workers were killed, both sell weapons. What are your demands? Sure. Well, obviously, Texas is a state uh, that has an infatuation uh, with weapons, uh, and these are weapons that are readily available uh, in our communities. Um, you know, I want to respond to uh, Lieutenant Governor's uh, statement that, uh, you know, this is about video games. You know, video games didn't kill 20 people in our community. Uh, video games did not uh, maim 26 additional people who are fighting for their lives in the hospital. It was a white supremacist with a high-powered automatic assault rifle that killed those individuals. Uh, not a video game. And for politicians to skirt around the truth, um, to identify the problem instead 
and uh, implement policies uh, that address this issue uh, is shameful. Uh, we must do more. Uh, as a state representative, I have authored uh, legislation uh, that bans uh, bump stock style magazines uh, to be sold in our state. Never received a hearing. Uh, I have also authored uh, legislation to eliminate the online uh, loopholes uh, where people can purchase uh, 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 weapons without background checks. We need major gun reform now, uh, but we also need to identify that there is a spread of white nationalism uh, throughout this country that is now accompanied by acts of violence. Uh, these are domestic terrorists uh, in our country, and we should treat them no different from al-Qaeda. We should treat them no different from uh, the, those individuals who have attacked us uh, in the past. You look at other countries such as Japan and, and, and South Korea that has a very large gaming uh, community and in industry, video games. We don't see those, these type of acts of violence in their countries. So to blame video games is irresponsible. Uh, I call on uh, both Republicans and de Democrats alike uh, to make meaningful reforms, uh, not only on, uh, on assault weapons, but also to condemn uh, these acts of violence by white supremacists. Uh, our president, I think, uh, as a leader, I agree with Senator Cory Booker's comments. Our presidents historically have united uh, our country. Uh, and for this president to uh, stoke fear and stoke uh, 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 acts of uh, violence and, and a message uh, and joking about it in his political rallies uh, is unpresidential. Um, so we need uh, our politicians to act swiftly. Uh, they need to have the moral courage to do what's right. And really, that's at the end of the day, that's, that's what's missing in this uh, uh, conversation is the lack of, of, of strength and courage for elected officials to do the right thing because they're afraid of uh, the NRA, they're afraid of their racist base, and uh, it's unfortunate that they're not speaking out against uh, this, these un-American uh, values that have, uh, uh, have come uh, to hurt our communities. I want to thank you both for being with us. Uh, Bernie Sanders recently tweeted there are more than 5 million assault weapons out on the streets of America, which is more than the U.S. military has. That is insane. We must ban the sale, distribution and transfer of assault weapons. And he goes on from there. There are more weapons in the United States than people. I want to thank you both for being with us from El Paso, which is something like 80 percent Latino and one of the safest cities in the country. Fernando Garcia of Border Network for Human Rights and Cesar Blanco, Texas House of Representatives uh, representative. Thank you both for being there. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, white supremacy, white supremacist violence, that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, and then the implosion of the NRA. What is holding back even Democratic politicians from demanding at this moment bans on assault weapons and other gun regulations? Stay with us. We could be the healing when you're feeling all alone. We could be the reason to find the strength to carry on. In a world that's so divided, we shall overcome. We could be the healing. We can be the flower in the gun. We could be the healing. We can be the flower in the gun. What would I say to my son or to my daughter if they came and asked me about these days? What kind of reason could I give for all the hate that's standing in the way? Wish I could tell them that nobody's gonna judge them, and every stranger on the block is gonna love them. No bully in the world could ever hurt them, but I can't. Say that today. Whoa. No one could ever take your pride from you. Speak your truth and let your spirit fly. Cause we could be the healing. When you're feeling all alone, we could be the reason. Michael Franti. 
Today and Spearhead, the flower. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman. As we continue to discuss the mass shooting in El Paso, Texas, where an anti-immigrant white supremacist gunman shot dead 20 people, mostly Latinos, in a crowded Walmart. According to The New York Times, white extremist shooters have now killed at least 63 people in the United States over the past 18 months. Um, last month, FBI Director Christopher Wray told members of the Senate Judiciary Committee that crime driven by racism and white supremacy is on the rise compared to the previous year, and that his agency recorded around 100 arrests for domestic terrorism in the past nine months. A uh, majority of the um, domestic terrorism uh, cases that we've investigated uh, are motivated by some version of what you might call white supremacist violence. But former FBI agents say there's reluctance within the agency to tackle white nationalist violence, in part due to President Trump's rhetoric. Former FBI supervisor Dave Gomez told The Washington Post, quote, there's some reluctance among agents to bring forth an investigation that targets what the president perceives as his base. It's a no-win situation for the FBI agent or supervisor, he said. Joining us now is Mike Sherman, fellow at Brennan Center for Justice at New York University Law School. He's the author of the forthcoming book, Disrupt, Discredit and Divide, How the New FBI Damages Democracy. From 1988 to 2004, Mike Sherman served as an FBI agent specializing in domestic counterterrorism. So, we have this weekend of horror, from El Paso to Dayton. We don't know exactly the motives of the Dayton shooter at this point. Killed nine people, mainly African-American. He also killed his sister in that mass slaughter. Um, on, we do know, however, um, what's being attributed a manifesto to the El Paso shooter. Um, who is in custody and apparently talking to um, uh, the authorities, uh, when he went into one of the most Latino Walmarts in America and just started shooting. Can you respond to what's taken place and talk about um, the words the president does not want to use, white supremacy, white nationalism, and how that affects investigations in this country? Uh, so, President Trump, from the time he was first announcing his candidacy, was was using very divisive rhetoric that fit uh, very well into the white nationalist uh, ideology and identifying the targets uh, that that were the the them that we needed to protect us from, and and those tend to be uh, immigrant communities and. Uh, I think that gave white nationalists a, a bit of comfort that their ideas had permeated into the mainstream. And we saw a lot of these white nationalists become part of the mainstream conversation when, when mainstream media started interviewing them about the candidacy of Donald Trump. So unfortunately, as we've seen the violence increase from these public rallies and riots, uh, we haven't seen a law enforcement response that, that would dissuade uh, this kind of violence. So there's this uh, idea that, that, that the violence is sanctioned and that that's when it becomes very dangerous, when, when the, these white supremacist groups believe that the government actually approves of their conduct and is encouraging them to act. And, and that's what I think is very dangerous right now. And unfortunately, the federal government has not reacted in a way uh, to dissuade this kind of violence. You know, like the day before um, Mueller testified, all the attention on Mueller, uh, Christopher Wray testified before the Senate, and he raised this issue of domestic terrorism, of white supremacy. He's a Trump pick here for head of the FBI. That got very little attention. Um, so, what does the government understand that it's not investigating? What reports have been suppressed around the uh, rise of white supremacy, domestic terrorism? So, I, I appreciated Director Ray's statements that white supremacy presents a, a persistent threat in the United States. But unfortunately, their policies have actually masked how they use their domestic terrorism resources to, to uh, make it harder for the Congress to understand how, how many of those resources are going toward white supremacist violence. Uh, Senator Durbin, back in 2017, introduced a bill, the Domestic Terrorism Prevention Act, that would have required the FBI to document 
how many incidents and fatalities were a result of each type of each category of domestic terrorism uh, in, in the domestic terrorism program, and then how many investigations and, and prosecutions occurred in each category, which I believe would have shown uh, a, a disproportionate inv investigations against groups that were not nearly as violent as white supremacists. Uh, instead of producing that data, what, what the FBI did was change the way they collect the data. So they grouped uh, anarchists with uh, anti-government militias uh, under a category of anti-government. They grouped what had been a white supremacist category with what they had previously called black identity extremists, so that it would be harder to discern how many, whether appropriate resources are going to where there are actually violent acts attributable to these groups. So this is a problem that's longstanding. Uh, we, the Justice Department, as a matter of policy and practice, has deprioritized the investigation of, of white supremacists. And, and we talk about a rise in white supremacist violence. But the truth is, we don't know whether there's a rise because nobody actually accounts for this violence. The federal government today doesn't know how many white supremacists kill people each year. And, and they haven't been keeping these records, even as counterterrorism became its number one priority. Uh, so what, what they need to do is change these policies. You know, recently, uh, some former and current Justice Department officials have been arguing that, that they need new laws, that there aren't sufficient laws. Well, I worked these cases in the 1990s, and nobody suggested we didn't have enough law. Uh, in fact, there are plenty of laws, and we wrote a report at the Brennan Center last year, Wrong Priorities on Fighting Terrorism, to show the, the scope of the laws, not just 52 terrorism laws uh, that apply to domestic terrorism, uh, but five federal hate crime statutes addressing the kind of crimes that white supremacists often commit, organized as crime statutes that would prevent the, the organized groups that act violently and persist because their members can replace one another, uh, but and also other conspiracy statutes. So there are, are plenty of, of laws. It's a matter of policy. And as a matter of policy, the Justice Department uh, t takes um, hate crimes and, and defers them to state and local prosecution. And only 12 percent of police departments across the country even report hate crimes. So we know that the state and locals aren't, aren't responding to this appropriately, yet the federal government just defers to, to them. Speaking to Fox News, Texas Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick ordered the anti-fascist, anti-racist movement Antifa to stay out of Texas following Saturday's mass shooting at the El Paso Walmart. You know, I was I was uh, looking at a story recently. Um, I just saw in the last couple of days where Antifa is is posting. Uh, you know, they want to come to El Paso and do a ten day siege. Um, clear message: to Antifa, stay out of El Paso, um, stay out of Texas, basically. But we don't need uh, them coming in on September first. We didn't need them to begin with before this happened. But I would uh, I would say to Antifa, um, scratch Texas off your map and don't come in. So I mean, here the. Um the uh, lieutenant governor of Texas is being asked about um, the alleged gunman, and uh, he targets Antifa. President Trump has also targeted Antifa. He recently said the anti-fascist movement should be considered a terrorist organization. Um, Mike German, can you respond? Yeah, it's troubling because this is bubbling up from these far-right white supremacist websites into the mainstream not just in the media, but now from from government officials. So it's quite troubling that there's this distraction, right? To, to the Antifa, the anti-fascist, anti-racist groups. There there are no fatalities in the United States uh, resulting from these groups for at least a couple of decades. So why we're even talking about that in a counterterrorism context when you have groups that are killing people and we're not responding to to those groups in a way that's comprehensive and helps us really understand the problem so we can address it more properly. In fact, today, I mean, this is all so horrifying. I think um, uh, El Paso and Dayton were something like the 250th and 251st mass shootings this year. 
Then, going back years, I mean, just today, uh, August 5th, is the seventh anniversary of the Oak Creek mass shooting at a Sikh temple in Wisconsin, in which six Sikhs were killed. Absolutely. And it's troubling because they've had this uh, tacit support from the government. They've had this uh, laxity in, in law enforcement following up from when they commit public violence that I believe they've been able to recruit in a way that, that wasn't possible in the 1990s when I worked this, uh, this issue. Um, so I'm concerned that typically, if you look through history, you tend to see a lot more political violence around elections. And because they've had this space to, to recruit and this tacit support from the government, that they can become much more dangerous. And unless the government starts responding very differently very soon, uh, I'm afraid that we're only going to see more of this. I want to thank you very much for being with us, Mike German, fellow at Brennan Center for Justice at New York University Law School, author of the forthcoming book, Disrupt, Discredit and Divide, How the New FBI Damages Democracy. And on that issue of this being the seventh anniversary of the uh, Sikh Temple massacre, in which— um, Six people were killed. The shooter was a white supremacist and veteran. He died by suicide that day. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, what are the Democrats afraid of as the NRA, the National Rifle Association, implodes? Stay with us. I was only 16 when the man came down to pull it. Big dreams in my heart, I got shot down by a bullet. And I tried, I tried to run away. But where do you go if the world that you know is unsafe? And I'm gone, so please remember me. You can take all you want, but you never take my memory. And I'm gone, so please remember me. Even after I'm gone, you can still be the one who saves me. Even after I'm gone, you can still be the one who saves me. Save Me by Connecticut high school student Tyler Jenkins, written as part of the March for Our Lives student movement against gun violence. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman. As we continue to look at the this weekend's deadly gun violence in this country, over the span of 13 hours, um, the country was shaken by two mass shootings. An anti-immigrant white supremacist gunman shot dead 20 people, overwhelming Latino, in a crowded Walmart in El Paso, Texas. Thirteen hours later, a gunman who had a history of threatening women shot dead nine people, including his own sister, outside a bar in Dayton. Most of the victims were African American. President Trump briefly spoke of the killing Sunday, didn't mention guns, domestic terror or white nationalism. Senator Bernie Sanders and other Democratic lawmakers calling on Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell to hold a special Senate, a special session of the Senate to vote on two gun safety bills recently passed in the House. This all comes as the NRA, the National Rifle Association, is imploding. We're joined now by Alex Yablon, a reporter at The Trace, a news outlet devoted to gun-related news. His most recent piece headline, Mass Shootings Are Destroying Our Sense of Public Space. Alex, thanks for being with us. And thank you for your news organization, for The Trace. Start off, we talked a lot about El Paso. What do we know about Dayton, about the killings that took place, I mean, hours after what happened in El Paso? So, in contrast to the El Paso shooting, the Dayton shooting does not appear to be ideologically motivated. Uh, instead, it's more in line with past mass shootings we've seen, where a young man uh, has a history of antisocial and threatening behavior. Young and white man. A young white man who then lashes out in public. Uh, it emerged that he was suspended from high school um, after compiling a kill list or rape list of uh, young women that were in his uh, in his school. Um, that's the kind of thing that, in a state with a red flag law. Uh, which is a procedure that allows a judge to order a seizure of someone's guns, even if they're legally owned, if you can demonstrate that that person pre presents an imminent threat to themselves or others, that could have been the basis for a red flag 
uh, seizure, uh, a complaint. But Ohio does not have a red flag law, though Governor Mike DeWine, a Republican, uh, actually backs one. Um, so right now, aside from the the uh, the actual act itself, there doesn't appear to be uh, any kind of ideological tie between well, the two I mean, incidents. Uh, also in this case, and you often have this in these cases, um, uh, uh, why, whether white supremacists or not, these uh, white young men often have a link to, in addition to white supremacy, v violence against women. Um, this one is just very clear with his killing of his own sister, who was at the area in Dayton with a friend. Yeah, misogyny is a really clear link between so many mass shootings that we've seen. Uh, one of the biggest warning signs or risk factors for mass shootings or any other kind of shooting is a past history of threats or violent behavior. And the way that violent individuals behave, they grow through patterns of escalation. And it usually starts with those closest to them, either family members, dating partners, spouses, or classmates. So it's not surprising at all, unfortunately, to see that the suspect in Dayton uh, had this history of, of intimidating and threatening uh, people that he knew. I want to get to um, what seems to have held back so many uh, Democratic and maybe Republican legislators at state level and in Congress, and that is the power of the NRA pouring money into elections. Apparently, they poured less money in in November uh, than, um, you know, the gun control groups, but now also are going through a massive spasm, a kind of implosion. Can you talk about what has happened at the NRA? Sure. So the NRA is in very deep crisis. It went from the apogee of its powers in 2016, when it spent uh, more than any other single special interest group to back President Trump and uh, congressional Republicans' election efforts, to a deep fiscal crisis, um, accusations of profound corruption at the top of the organization and self-dealing, not to mention just run-of-the-mill financial mismanagement. Um, Longtime figures in the group like uh, Chris Cox, who was the top lobbyist and was largely was widely seen as the likely next uh, leader of the group, uh, were forced out, as well as a number of board members. Uh, so basically, this all stems from some reporting by my colleague Mike Spees uh, and many other reporters that found that for a long time. The group has had, had an unusually close relationship with its top vendor, which is an ad firm called Ackerman McQueen, that has worked with the NRA since the late 80s, basically as long as Wayne LaPierre has been in charge. And uh, it's very difficult to say where, where uh, the NRA began and where the NRA ended and Ackerman McQueen ended, uh, and Ackerman McQueen began. Uh, a lot of figures who were sort of the some of the most well-known public faces of the NRA, such as uh, Dana Lash, uh, were actually Ackerman McQueen employees who uh, worked on behalf of the NRA uh, through uh, projects like NRA TV, which is now shut down. Basically, uh, the group's accountants and some board members found out that there was no due diligence being performed on these contracts, which had gone, which had ballooned to $40 million a year. Uh, we have 20 seconds. And um, those who have raised concerns about it have been forced out of the organization. Um, we're going to do part two of this conversation, put online at democracynow.org. But this seems to be a key moment for gun control groups. I mean, you even have the New York Post front page day as you were coming here at Democracy Now! You might have seen ban weapons of war. And we're going to talk more about that at democracynow.org. Al Alex Yablon, reporter at The Trace. His most recent piece will link to mass shootings are destroying our sense of public space. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us.